For those of you who do not know me, my name is Natalie Arsenault. I am a talk radio host. Uh, I have a show that airs on 1070 KNTH every Saturday. Um, and I am a avid Medina supporter. Um, so I'm not gonna take a long time. Since I, I talk on the radio, I like to keep the ball moving. Um, but before we get started and the introduction of um, the keynote speakers, I wanted to kind of do a little bit of review, um, just in case some of us have forgotten our history, which, you know, I did too, because as I was reading through some of this stuff, I was like, wow, really? Texas? <laughs> so God told Moses to remind the people. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm not Moses, but I am going to remind y'all. Um, <laughs> there were two conventions with no avail where Texans asked their government to reform policies. On October 2nd, 1835, the War of Texas Independence began at the Battle of Gonzales, followed by several victorious battles, including the Battle of Concepcion, where Texans were outnumbered five to one. That's how we do it here, five to one, and we still won, against Mexico. By April 1836, Texans had proposed a Texas Declaration of Independence, we had lost the Alamo, found new strength to fight for the freedom battle, and with the leadership of Sam Houston, who later became our first elected president of Texas, soundly defeated General Santa Ana at the Battle of San Jacinto. Here, here. That's for Noe back there. <laughs> Securing Texas's independence. So if I have the math right, 1832 to 1836 is about four years four years to secure the Republic of Texas. By December 29th, 1845, Texans by an overwhelming vote of the citizens of Texas had decided to officially join the United States of America. The union that even through a civil war, we've determined that we've become stronger because of that union. Made stronger because of documents like the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights, made stronger because the federal government and the state government have clear boundaries set forth in those documents and solidified by the 10th Amendment. I wanted to remind you of our history as Texans because we are different. We've been our own nation and We've also been a one state in a national body. We are diplomats and we are fighters. We have seen an overreaching, unyielding arm of the government and we have conquered it. We know better than anyone what it truly means to be sovereign. And while we are part of this blessed union of states known as the United States of America, we have not forgotten our past under the Mexican government and we are forecasting our future under a tyrannical administration. The 10th Amendment says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's a clear boundary. <laughs> And it is time that we, all of us, begin to elect official, officials from governors to state reps to state senators, sheriffs, judges, all of our elected officials need to understand that boundary. And they need to be willing to draw a line in the sand and then dare the federal government to step over it. Okay, so I know what y'all are all saying right now. You're like, Natalie, well, let's just get the guns because we're fighters, right? Okay. So, <laughs> hold on to your horses. Remember that I said Texans are also diplomats <laughs> and we're fighters. But as diplomats, we do have some tools at our disposal. 
tools that our state elected officials can assert our 10th Amendment rights under. One of those tools is nullification, which basically is the act of negating or voiding the existence of a law, and that's used by our legislative branch in the State House. And many states have used nullification, and for God's sake, it is not an argument only used by the South to keep slavery. It's not some ancient relic that no one pulls out of the closet. It is being used today. It's been used to negate gun rights from federal um, legislators, real ID, no child left behind. And if God help us, our legislators and our governors across the nation stand up and get a spine, health care reform as well. But I'm not just going to leave the onus on the state legislators. There's also something called interposition that the governor can use. And it's a tool that's used by state governors to interpose their authority to protect their citizens from the unconstitutional measures of the federal government, which is also why we need a new governor. Okay. I suggest we strongly urge our elected officials to use these diplomatic tools because from the history lesson I talked about earlier, we all know that Texans are fighters. We can fight you in the State House, the White House, or the Courthouse. And speaking of courthouses, the honored guest and patriot that I'm about to introduce is no newbie to a courthouse fight. I am beyond excited to introduce our first speaker. And quite honestly, speaker really doesn't do him justice. Um, there's a lot that I could say about this young man, but I'd rather tell you a short story. On November 30th, 1993, President Bill Clinton signed into law the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, a bill that for the first time in the history of our nation mandated background checks on all purchasers of firearms. Little did President Clinton know that a county sheriff would stand up and say, not in my town. In 1994, Sheriff Richard Mack filed a lawsuit challenging the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, also known as the Brady Bill, to stop the federal government from forcing another unfunded mandate down our throats. Sheriff Mack won that case in the U.S. Supreme Court on the issue of states' rights. So clearly, it's not an ancient relic. The Tenth Amendment is alive. It's there in the Bill of Rights. That decision catapulted him into national spotlight with hundreds of TV and radio appearances. Additionally, Sheriff Mack lectures and gives seminars on constitutional issues relating to gun control, law enforcement, state rights, and that farce otherwise known as the drug war. <laughs> He's been a consultant for lawyers and people in general, helping them with cause cases of unlawful arrest and police misconduct. He stood for the little guy against big brother government. So when, <laughs> so when the phone rings for Hillary Clinton's proverbial 3 a.m. call that I'm sure you guys are all aware of, I'd like Sheriff Mack to answer. <laughs> And I know that we can all sleep well because our liberties and freedoms, as given to us by God, are being protected by a man who has challenged the system and won. It is with great pleasure that I give you Sheriff Richard Mack. Texans just never cease to amaze me. And uh, I'll reiterate my commitment to uh, Deborah and her family and her campaign. When she wins, I'm moving here. Uh, 
I don't know. I just want to live in a state that believes in freedom. I don't know. To call me crazy. <laughs> so, well, we've got a lot to cover. And, and again, I, I thank you so much uh, for being here and for having me back to Texas. Um, I don't know how many times I've been here in the last year, but it's about as many times as I've been to Arizona, and I live in Arizona. <laughs> so I love it here, um, and uh, I thank you. Uh, the spirit of freedom is the spirit of Texas. And uh, I can feel that when I've been here. And I'll tell you what, uh, there is no question when I took my family to the Alamo that you could feel it inside that building. It was very touching and uh, very powerful experience uh, going through there. Uh, and that's the exact same thing that we all need to feel uh, throughout our country. And this is a revival. And uh, Natalie touched on it a little bit, uh, uh, but this is a peaceful one. And uh, I pray that this effort to get people like Deborah Medina in office and to make sure that we have constitutional sheriffs all across this country, that will be the answer. And we will not be required uh, to take up arms to take back our freedom this time. If we have the right people with the courage to stand for our Constitution and for the fundamental principles that this country was based on in the first place, people who are ready to stand today and keep your word and keep your oath, a solemn and sacred oath that you will uphold, defend, protect, preserve, and obey the United States Constitution just keep your word, and we keep it peaceful. Yeah. Uh, just for the sake of time, I, I'm not going to go through uh, my conversion process. Uh, suffice it to say <laughs> that when I was a rookie cop, uh, I was so dismayed with what I saw law enforcement and government doing that I started reading and studying the Constitution. And I looked at the Constitution in my right hand and looked at government, what it was doing in my left hand, and I do mean left, way left, yeah. you know? Um, and I compared the two, and as an investigator and as a police officer, I can honestly tell you my report was there was no similarity. And there is no similarity. And today our Constitution has been replaced by political mainstream correctness from both sides of the aisle. And uh, I, I am sorry that that has happened, but it is the truth. And if you want somebody to, you know, give you a bunch of flowery things and, you know, blow smoke up your backside, then go listen to some of the mainstream politicians, because that's what they will do because they only care about one thing, and that's getting reelected. And I know that uh, that is not Deborah Medina's primary concern. We'll get her elected once, she'll do her job, and if that earns her a second term, so be it. If it gets her voted out, so be it. But let me tell you what I learned. I lost my third election. And what I learned from that was probably the most valuable lesson that any politician could ever learn. And that is that it's essential, that it's vital, that it's the only thing that matters, that you, as a public servant, worry more about keeping your oath than you do about keeping your job. And that's where it all comes from. So I do want to go through with you and make sure that you understand something that I did that actually has brought me here to you today, and that is the lawsuit I filed against the Clinton administration to stop the Brady Bill. Why would a small town sheriff say, I'm going to take on the federal government, I'm going to take on the Clintons? You know, how many people sued the Clintons and lived to tell about it? Yeah. 
Okay. So, uh, so when I decided to uh, sue my own federal government as a sheriff, as a small town sheriff in Arizona, the fourth smallest county in Arizona, population wise and pretty much geographically as well, why would, why would I be that naive? Why would I be that stupid to think that you can fight City Hall and do anything and change anything and make an impact? And uh, I guess it was kind of just naive. It was a knee-jerk reaction. And luckily, when I asked my advisor if this is something she would support, when I got home from a meeting of sheriffs in Phoenix, and I walked into my house and I said, um, her name's Dawn. Uh, and I said, Dawn, um, I'm going to sue the federal government and that's all there is to it and i got to stop this Brady Bill. And she's going, don't I get a kiss? <laughs> and um, I said, yeah, sure. And so I said, I said, no, on my drive home, um, I've decided that I'm going to sue the federal government, the Clinton administration, and it'll probably cost us our home and job and career. And that's it. And she endorsed the decision. She said, well, we really weren't looking for this job when we found it. And I said, you're right. And I said, I'll take that as a yes. And she said, she just nodded. And, uh, I wish, um, I wish she could be here tonight. She's uh, in Arizona babysitting our grandkids uh, for my daughter uh, while they're on their uh, uh, anniversary uh, little cruise down the Caribbean. So we got the grandkids. And I will tell you something about my first granddaughter. You know, I've, I've always been patriotic, and I've really loved the Founding Fathers, and I love America, and I love uh, being around Americans like you. And people who know and understand what America is about and the, the importance of adhering to our foundation and the importance of standing together hand in hand as Americans, no matter what our race is, no matter what our religion is. We tolerate all of that. And if you ask me, there's nothing to tolerate. I, and I mean that. I, I, I really, I don't care what race you are. I don't care what religion you are. You're my brothers and my sisters because we're Americans. There is one qualification to that. You have to be an American. You know, you have to be legal. Okay? And, um, but that's the only qualification I put on that. The rest of it, every one of you, as I look in your faces, I'd be proud to stand hand in hand with you as we restore America as the constitutional republic she was meant to be. And that's why I'm proud to stand with Deborah Medina. Yeah. Uh, so the little personal story I was going to tell you about my first grandchild, well, she was born a little over three and a half years ago. Yes, <laughs> on the 4th of July. Yeah, I've got six or seven now, I think, uh, if I recall, uh, grandkids. <laughs> and uh, the first one was born on the 4th of July. And uh, her name is Liberty LaDawn Hardy. She's a precious little girl. And um, she's uh, got the spunk of freedom in her eyes. And um, we're going to go over tonight. I want you to know what the decision really meant for America. What, what did this Supreme Court ruling do? Now, as soon as we won, I was no longer sheriff when the decision came out. I was at the a Tucson hotel that CBS News uh, asked me to be in so that they could get my immediate reaction. And we got all sorts of press during the uh, fight, during the trials, during this. Uh, when I filed, you would have thought, uh, that it was the next shot heard around the world. I mean, we got press. We got 300 calls the next week, within the next week, at 
the Graham County Sheriff's Office in Safford, Arizona. You've never even heard of that place, have you? And it's, it was amazing. Uh, I, I never anticipated any of that happening. Uh, when it, and, and so when we were fighting it and when we were filing it, we got huge press. When we won, it stopped. And I mean it stopped fast. So no one ever talked about what this decision did. What did it say? Nobody talked about that. I was on with Brian Williams the night of the victory uh, on MSNBC. I hadn't even read the decision yet, so we didn't get to talk about that part. But we did continue to say what I always said. When I was on the Phil Donahue show in New York, that was the first time I ever met the second sheriff who filed the lawsuit, who joined the lawsuit, Sheriff Prince from Montana, another small town sheriff. He and I, the first time we meet, meet is on the Phil Donahue show in New York City. <laughs> so yeah, there was some irony there. And uh, I said it then, and I've said it ever since, and I'll say it even more tonight. The federal government cannot tell me what to do. The federal government. The federal government cannot tell your sheriff what to do. They have absolutely no jurisdictional authority over your sheriff. And if he goes along, he's choosing to do so. And the same goes for the state. The federal government cannot tell your state what to do. It would be absolutely impossible for that to happen because the Constitution prohibits that very thing. And if you just look at history, well, who in the heck formed the federal government? The states. The 13 original states formed the federal government to do a few assigned tasks and we can read those in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. That's all they get. Because as Natalie said at the beginning, the Tenth Amendment prohibits them to go any further. And the rest, anything, whether it's traffic or drug problems or whatever, health care, if that is to be done, it is a state responsibility. Okay? And then the county should be fighting the state to stop such abuse. <laughs> so what are we doing now? Uh, the President of the United States, and I don't care who it is, I don't care if it's George Washington himself, it doesn't matter who's in the office, whoever is in the White House has no authority whatsoever to tell your sheriff what to do. It doesn't matter. We all take the same oath. From the dog catcher all the way down to the president. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so, so, so I'm going to be going over, and, and just so you know, um, I, I have the book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. I wrote this book specifically because I was so dis depressed and dismayed over last year's election. Or, of 08, not of 09. Of 08. And my wife kept telling me, turn the TV off. Quit watching that crap. <laughs> and uh, I said, I can't help it. I'm watching my country die here, and I just can't, I can't turn, the, turn away. And I really had such hope for Ron Paul, and I, and I really admire what he's done and what he has stood for. Uh, and now uh, it's time to turn inward because the only answer left to us is state sovereignty. That's it. And uh, so I, I said there has to be some hope. And at first, I'll tell you honestly, uh, and this really isn't a joke, even though it might sound like one to you, it's not a joke. At first, I really liked Barack Obama. Now, now some of you, I can see in your faces right now, uh, Sheriff Mack, we know enough about you that that cannot be true. You know? No, I did. Because he was doing something I wanted really bad. He was beating Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yep. And so, because I said all along, there's no way this country is going to elect uh, a guy with a, that name. You know, Osama or Obama, that just wasn't going to ring right with voters. There's no way. Um, and so uh, we got both of them. And uh, so I said, there has to be some hope. And I said, look, Mac, 
You've been studying this and researching this for decades. Put it together. And the title hit me. The, the, at first, the title was, uh, to me, the county sheriff, the last line in the sand. And I said, no, no, it, almost. And then it said, well, of course, hope. There has to be hope. The county sheriff, America's last hope. And really, the play on words is there is that state sovereignty is America's last hope. And the last, after everything falls apart with everything, where the rubber really meets the pavement is who's going to enforce what in your county. And that's why the sheriff is the last word. Whether it's a good word or a bad word, he's the last word. Whether he says, oh, I can't do anything about it, it's not my jurisdiction, not my problem, I don't have the authority, or whatever excuse he wants to use to not keep his oath to you, his boss, or it's he catches the vision of what he is all about and understands the oath and the Constitution, and he keeps it, and he does it, and he does his duty and lets the consequences fall where they may. And, and folks, I'm telling you, in one year's time, this book came out February 15th of 09, okay? And now we have sheriffs that have read this book who have called me because I have a chapter dedicated to, uh, it's called The Real Criminals, and that's about the IRS. Yeah. And I've actually had two sheriffs call me and say that they're considering arresting IRS agents in their counties. Yeah. <laughs> So the miracles just keep happening, and uh, Deborah Medina's campaign is not the only one that has had some miracles, and she has, and it's, this is a day of celebration, and it's going great, and if you'd have said that she would be on debates just two or three months ago, she would have told you you're crazy, and now she is, and she's been working hard. <laughs> So, when we won this case, and let me remind all of you, these sheriffs, ultimately seven out of 3,100, seven joined this lawsuit. And a little bit disappointing was the fact that out of 254 counties in Texas, only one in Texas, Sheriff Coog, God rest his soul, from uh, Valverde County. And uh, he joined it. And the, the first two, uh, I was the first one, Sheriff Mack, and the second, Sheriff Prince, he and I were the ones chosen to be at the United States Supreme Court on December 4th, 1996. And that was an awesome experience for this small town boy. To walk inside the United States Supreme Court, it was absolutely a spiritual uh, the most uplifting freedom feeling I've ever had, equal to that of the Alamo when I went in there. And it wasn't that I was honoring the justices. I was honoring the place, and I felt it, that it was hallowed ground. And uh, I sat near uh, James Brady, for whom the Brady Bill was named, because he was shot during the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. He was the press secretary, and he, he got the worst of it. And he's confined to a wheelchair. And I went over and shook his hand and told him I really admired him and uh, that I thought he was a good man. Uh, I, I can't say that about his wife, but I did say and met, felt, felt it and meant it about him. Uh, and right after we won, uh, Bill Clinton ordered Janet Reno to issue a memo to all sheriffs and chiefs of police across the country to ignore the ruling that it was just a token victory for the NRA and the NRA did help us with the case immensely, and uh, that uh, they should just keep doing what they're doing. In other words, ignore the ruling. Um, and so uh, I used to have that memo. I can't remember. Somebody gave it to me. One of the chiefs or sheriffs that got it gave it to me. I don't have that anymore, but I do know what happened. Uh, and the, the press and the White House and the Congress did a great job of just going about their business and violating this ruling basically uh, on a weekly, maybe even a daily basis. And, and you'll see why when I, when I tell you what this decision says and did. And there's a lot of the decision in this book. Uh, there's only four resources for the book. 
uh, the United States Supreme Court decision, Mac Prince versus U.S., the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, and a little bit the Gettysburg Address. That's it. So it's really going to be hard for somebody to refute this book. <laughs> and that's why I write them short, because you have no excuse not to read it. You know? <laughs> Neither does your sheriff. Okay? Make sure he gets it right after you read. You, you make sure you get two. One should stay in your home, and you should pass the other one around. You know, and there's a lot of people in here who have already ordered dozens, haven't they, Bruce? Yeah. I wish everybody would do what Bruce did. He, he, took, it to, he took one to every deputy and employee of his sheriff's office in his county. Yeah. So, let's, um, I want to start, I want to start with Z. Usually, usually when you do something, you start with A, B, C, you know, but I'm going to start with Z. We're going to start at the end. We're going to start with what Justice Scalia, who wrote the, the opinion for the majority on our case, on the Mac Prince case. Uh, but right before I get to him, this is a little side note. This, this could have been absolutely catastrophic because at the bottom, and I have a few of these, these are, this is an actual copy of the decision, and I, have, I, I brought a few with me. Um, we probably ought to auction those off for a fundraiser for, for Deborah Medina. We did that in Mississippi, and, it, it, and one got $400. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Justice Stevens wrote the opinion for the minority, and it was a 5-4 split. Same as the Heller case in Washington, D.C., okay? And this is what Justice Stevens would have been. This would have been case law, and many would have thought it was the supreme law of the land, would have been the law of the land. But we'll get into that argument, whether or not that's true or not. But this is still what the Supreme Court would have ruled had we lost, okay? Get this. Justice Stevens. If Congress believes that such a statute will benefit the people of the nation and serve the interests of cooperative federalism better than an enlarged federal bureaucracy, like they really care about that. They don't want to enlarge the federal bureaucracy. No, they don't want everyone to do that. We, get this, we, the United States Supreme Court, we should respect both its policy judgment and its appraisal of its constitutional power. Are you kidding me? That would have been the law of the land. I'll bet you, I'll bet you that uh, the national media would have had a filled day with all that and would have really shoved that down our throats. Instead, when we won, it got shut off. But if that would have won, oh man, we told you the federal government was supreme. We told you Congress can do whatever they want. And now you have a Supreme Court justice saying exactly that. So why do we need the Supreme Court if Congress can do whatever it wants? He just, he just made himself irrelevant. Didn't even know it, did he? Yeah. Okay, but let's see what the real order, the last paragraph of the case. And it's hard for me not to stop and say and, and comment on each one of the principles involved here. But I'm going to read it, and then we're going to go through some of these things. Because I really want you to understand, because it totally reinforces what I've written about the sheriff, what I've written about the states, and that two-word motto and principle that your governor has to know and understand. State sovereignty. Okay? That's vital. And we're going to see that it actually is that way. It's vital to freedom. Okay, this is Scalia with the winning side. We held in New York, and he's talking about the New York case, New York versus United States. We held in New York that Congress cannot compel the states to enact a federal regulatory program. Sounds good, huh? Didn't hear too much about that case either, did you? Today we hold that Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by conscripting the state's officers directly. The federal government, this, this is so powerful, folks. You, you, you're not going to believe what I'm just going to read. The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, 
nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty." End quote. Folks, do you think that nationalized, socialistic, Marxist health care is qualifying as a federal regulatory program? Yeah. Wouldn't you love it if your state legislature knew that and your governor and they say, huh, we're not going to take Obamacare. You know why? Because we don't have to. And we don't have to pass another law saying it. We're just saying no. And guess what? We're not going to. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so, uh, the motto of this whole case, I mean several times throughout this case, it, it says that the states are not subject to federal direction. I mean all throughout this. Okay, page six. We have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. <laughs> okay, ah, oh, I know what you're thinking. I know you've been around this government so much and you've seen what money does in Washington, D.C. We've seen it recently, haven't we? They just bribed a senator with our money. And he took it. And what's everybody in Washington, D.C. said? Well, that's what everybody does. We're all crooks. We've been crooked for a long time. What's the matter with you people? This is the way Washington, D.C. works. How many times, folks, do we have to get hit over the head with the baseball bat of Washington, D.C. corruption before we finally get it? Do you got it now? Okay, let me tell you. The answer, absolutely, positively, will never be in Washington, D.C. I don't care if you have a hundred Ron Pauls there. You can't hurdle over that cesspool that's pulling it down. In fact, bottom line, if God doesn't strike Washington, D.C. down, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. You know, that's all there is to it. It's the most corrupt place on the face of the planet. So, okay. Now, I've heard, I've heard a lot of things on national TV, and I, I really get a kick out of uh, Bill O'Reilly because he prides himself on being the no spin, you know? Yeah, I laugh too. And I sent him, in, uh, he ticked me off so bad a couple of months ago that he, you know, he was talking to some national politician, I can't remember who it was, but he said, well, you know that the federal government trumps the states in everything. How, how did we get to that point? You know, the founding fathers here, this is what Bill O'Reilly wants to spin on all of you, that the founding fathers just went through an eight year, nine year war to gain our independence from a tyrant so that they could make it a new one out of the United States Congress. And that, oh, we don't want the King of England to be our boss, but we do want the Congress to be our boss. I don't think so. Uh, that is not, in fact, the very essence and purpose of the Constitution was to do just the opposite. Keep the federal government in check. And so now we have a, a system based entirely on checks and balances. And there's two ultimate checks and balances, the governor and the sheriff. And when those two fail, then you can grab your guns, okay? Then you're on your own, okay? So, um, okay, so here, here another decision, <clears throat> or another part of the decision. Okay, folks, uh, you can Google this or look it up yourself too. I don't want people, people think that I'm making this stuff up, okay? I'm just the messenger. I plagiarize everything, but I plagiarize most of it right out of my decision, so I guess that's okay, yeah? <laughs> So it is, quoting again, it is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. Now, okay, there's dual, two. 
Who are the two sovereigns they're talking about here? They're talking about the United States government. Yes, absolutely. A lot of you want to say, well, they're not sovereign. Ah, ah, ah. Yes, they are. They have a little bit. What they haven't totally given over to the United Nations uh, and destroyed through that political process. Um, that, yes, they are sovereign. And where? In what the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 8, assigned to the federal government, they are supreme and sovereign. We cannot stop that part. The only thing of it is, though, as Scalia says, uh, quote, residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course, in the Constitution's conferral upon Congress of not all governmental powers. Well, there's a revelation for Washington, D.C. politicians, isn't it? We don't have all powers. What, boy, that would, that would hurt their feelings. <laughs> you know? Okay. But only discrete enumerated ones. In other words, what the federal government gets to do is extremely limited. They are impotent in most areas. All right? So, uh, residual state sovereignty uh, is something that is uh, definitely there. It's ours. But if we don't exercise it, it's gone. And so just like through this evolution and this political process of, of over the past 70, 80 years of everybody turning to Washington, D.C., oh, please take care of us. Well, that should absolutely scare you to death. Because if you ask them to, they will. And that is a scary uh, aspect of this whole political process. Because these incompetent criminals will try to take care of you. Oof. So, again, um, it is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. Although the states, and I, and I disagree with the wording that Scalia uses here, Although the states surrendered many of their powers to the new federal government, he should have said, a few. We surrendered a few of our powers to the federal government when we formed them. Uh, they retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. Boy, there's that word again. D and do we all know what sovereign means? The word sovereignty, it means, just for the record, okay, we're on camera and all that, just for the record, it means you have no authority above you. You don't answer to anybody. You are the supreme authority on that issue. Okay? So when we say state sovereignty or that Texas is sovereign, that means we answer to no one else. Okay? And especially we do not answer to the United Nations. All right? All right. Now, and, and, and the issue of supremacy. Now, where does that word supremacy come? Well, it comes out of the Constitution, and there's what they call the Supremacy Clause. And I've had, I've had attorneys, and, and no offense to those of you who might be attorneys, but, man, I'm never going to vote for another attorney. <laughs> oh, but anyway, yeah. Um, and let me, I wanted to read that one about the Supremacy Clause. I don't, maybe I'd, but anyway, just so you know that, uh, that it is in this decision, they, uh, Scalia does a great job of making it very clear what the Supremacy Clause means. And, uh, oh yeah, here it is, good. Uh, page 11. Uh, the Supremacy Clause, however, makes law of the land you see, the federal government, when I was in Klamath Falls, Oregon, they turned off the water there just like they have in California. But this was just a smaller area. And they literally, the federal government, to try to check and see if the, this little minnow was okay after 90 years of using the same river for irrigation, they thought, well, we better check. And this was under the Bush administration, right after he got into office, actually. It's a big difference we made there. And we... <laughs> we um, we, so we had this big rally, and, and literally in that morning I had breakfast with about 10, 11 farmers and some of their families. And they told me, we have no other recourse but to grab our guns. They told me that. I had to talk them out of it. 
We stopped another Waco. Okay? These guys are ready to defend land and farms that were in their families for generations. And I drove by these farms and literally had tears coming down my cheeks looking at <clears throat> dust and weeds on some of the most fertile areas of our country in Oregon. And I told the, we talked to the sheriff and the county attorney, and the county attorney says, hey, the federal government's got the supremacy clause. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Have you ever read that? Did, in law school, did they talk about the supremacy clause, meaning that the federal government is supreme? You've got to be kidding me. You can't mean that. And so Scalia clarifies what the supremacy clause means, as if we couldn't read it for ourselves, but he clarifies it in this decision and says, the supremacy clause, however, makes law of the land only laws of the United States will, which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. So, <laughs> so where does that take us? Scalia even says that, so that all that, so the supremacy clause merely brings us back to the question discussed here at hand. Okay? Can the federal government tell us what to do? Can they boss us around? Are they the supreme? No, not even close. So, and amazingly, the very next paragraph, he uses as an example how the EPA was declared unconstitutional in the early 1970s. I, people think I make this stuff up. It's right here, folks. And um, it, it just, how did this all happen? EPA was ruled unconstitutional, and yet they got more powerful after that. I know how it happened. I won a case at the U.S. Supreme Court, too, and everybody ignored it went on. They know how to play the game. The Supreme, maybe the Founding Fathers made one little mistake in the Constitution, or the Supreme Court has made the mistake to not apply a punishment for those who subvert this. Um, I think the Founders thought that it would all be handled under the part where it says treason, you know? And maybe it should. Um, and so we're going to get back to that treason thing in just a second. So, uh, and then the next ones, the next ones I want to I want to discuss are, are right in the book. The points in, of the decision and some of the things that I talk about in the decision. Um, page 19, uh, last paragraph on page 19. Um, I, I really like it when the when the founding fathers endorse what I've said and done. And James Madison, the father of our Constitution, does just that. And I want to thank him for that. Because so many people have gotten after me and said, Oh, that Sheriff Mack, he's radical. Oh, man, you got to, he's scary. You know, he's, he's an icon of the militia. You know? And yeah, well, I don't know where that came from, but that's what Morris Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center called me. Yeah, there's a hero for you. Isn't that something? Yeah. So anyway, uh, but I have said on my website, SheriffMack.com, if any of you want to read it, and it's also in my latest book, The County Sheriff of America's Last Hope, that the greatest threat to God-given constitutional American liberty, the greatest threat to America, is not terrorists. It's our own federal government. Okay? Now, James... Uh, <laughs> President Madison says it and paraphrased it in another way. He said, quote, There are more instances of the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments from those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. You know, he used a big word there. Uh, he should have said, then, from violent and sudden attacks or overthrow. Because if, if America goes down, if America dies, it will be our own fault and be from within. No question. So where do we lose most of our freedom uh, that he said? From those in power. But by what? Gradual and silent encroachments. My dear friends, those encroachments are no longer silent, nor are they gradual. They're bold right in your face. And what has been the result of that? Tea parties all across the country. Well, I'm here to tell you it's time to stop throwing the poor tea in the harbor. We got to do a little bit more. Okay? 
Now, on page one, I, I, one of my favorite founders, Thomas Jefferson, he's at the bottom of the page, and, he quote, and I quote him. When all government shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will render powerless the checks provided and become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated, end quote. My brothers and sisters and fellow Americans, my question that I raise in the book to you and to your sheriff is this. When government becomes venal and oppressive, to whom can we turn for peace, safety, and protection? Why not to the very individual we hired who promised us in solemn oath that he would do just that? Does it really matter to you where the wolf comes from? Who the wolf's daddy was? How much money the wolf has? How fat, how skinny, how big, how m many gang members in the wolf gang there is? No, the sheriff promised to protect us from the wolves. It really matters not whether some of them are wearing three-piece suits and carrying fancy attache cases. He, she, promised to protect us from the wolves. In fact, I've never seen anything so dastardly than the federal wolves. Ask anyone who's ever been attacked by the IRS. The Gestapo of America, you know? Why have we allowed that? Because Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C. have made it so, plain and simply. So on page 15 of the book, we get some real specifics again from Justice Scalia and James Madison. Go figure, Scalia is quoting Madison in a Supreme Court monumental decision that a couple of small town sheriffs took before the U.S. Supreme Court. May I remind you once again, we won. Okay, make sure you take that with you from this meeting all across the country. These two small town sheriffs won. They kicked the federal. Yeah. <laughs> so. My mom's not here. I can say but. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't send her that part of the video. Okay, she taught me that. Okay, quoting right from the decision. The great innovation of this design was that our citizens would have two political capacities, one state, one federal. We all get that, right? This is the kicker. Each protected from incursion by the other. What? The United States Supreme Court said the states are supposed to protect us from the federal incursion? Yes. No wonder MSNBC didn't talk about this. No wonder Clinton wanted Reno to cover it up. No wonder. It even gets better. It gets more specific. It gets more powerful. Um, the local, I'm quoting again, folks, because Scalia is quoting Madison again. The local or municipal authorities, which ones? Counties and cities, okay? Towns. The local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. No more subject within their respective spheres to the general authority than the general authority is subject to them within its own sphere. So what did it just say? The federal government is no more subject to us than we are to them. So if they can tell us what to do, we can tell them what to do. If they can withhold money from us, we can withhold money from them. Ah! Yeah. So, when Deborah Medina becomes your governor, because the other two are mainstream politically correct, and you think that the other two are going to go, uh, we got a little message for you. We're not going to participate in the nationalized health care. Texas is exempt. And then they say, uh, well, we're going to withhold funds. Well, any governor is going to go, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding about that little crack about, you know, we're gonna, not going to go along. Of course we'll go along. You know, make the counties do it. Well, yeah. So when you have a real governor like Deborah Medina who says, we're not going along and we're not going to do a nationalized socialistic Marxist health care and you're not going to shove it down uh, our Texas otherwise healthy throats. Uh, 
And then the federal government says, well, we're going to make you do it. And if you don't do it, we're going to withhold funds. And then you have a governor who knows and understands the Constitution and what's the two words? State sovereignty. And she'll say, man, I'm really glad you brought that up. <laughs> because we're really tired of sending Texas money to Washington, D.C., where it's all thrown away. And you know, while we're at it, I think we're just going to stop sending federal income tax to you guys. We'll collect it in Austin and send you what we think you deserve. You know? So. Now, so where do we define that federal sphere as Madison and Scalia were calling it? Where do we define the federal sphere? We've talked about it before. Article 1, Section 8. Okay? That's where the federal government is sovereign. Let's just review that a little bit, shall we? How many law enforcement authorities were given by the Constitution to the federal government? Don't say zero. There's always somebody, oh, it's got to be zero. It's almost zero. We might, if we really stretch it, we might say four. Four. How many have they stolen or usurped? <laughs> the list is going on and on, but it's about 5,000 right now. Okay? So, what are they? Treason! Don't you wish the FBI would investigate treason? They'd never get out of Washington, D.C. I mean, they... <laughs> This is one time that we would all feel sorry for them and say, oh, get them more manpower, please, hire more. <laughs> and, okay, the other one, felonies committed on the high seas or piracies. And the other one, counterfeiting. Yeah, very good, counterfeiting. And uh, you might uh, also say violations of treaties, but there'd be very few of those because they would only be the ones that are constitutional. And so that would really cut that out. And um, that means that the treaty we have with the United Nations being in our soil would probably be ended and they'd have to go, oh, well, man, wouldn't that be wonderful? Get rid of them too. So, boy, this state sovereignty thing is going to solve a lot of problems, folks. It will. And so uh, when we're talking about that, uh, another place not outside Article 1, Section 8, it says that the federal government, I think Section 10, Article 10, of the Constitution, that they're assigned uh, to protect our borders. Right? They're supposed to protect us from invasion. So, obviously, when the federal government doesn't do their job, then the state's got to pick it up. You know? So, I know that with a governor like we have the potential of having that that's going to be solved as well. Now, let's, let's do the final blow here for state sovereignty out of this decision. This separation of the two spheres is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. What is it? State sovereignty is what? One of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. It's right here, page 16, in bold. Okay? A healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government. Do you want to know how to reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse? He says it. A healthy balance of power between the states and federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other. At the same time, each will be controlled by itself. Now, this is a Sheriff Mackism. The next question is, all mine. I'm not plagiarizing this one. So who is charged with safeguarding the people from the federal government when it refuses to control itself? State sovereignty. The people that are hired here in our counties and our state have the duty and the responsibility to protect us from tyranny. The book asks the question specifically, unambiguously, Sheriff, will you stand against tyranny? Will you stand against tyrants? Is there anything 
your sheriff could do that would be more important than that? Absolutely not even close. If he solved the drug problem in your county and allowed tyrants to do whatever they want and has continuously allowed the criminality that has been routine with the IRS and the EPA and the Endangered Species Act and blah, blah, on and on and on, it just doesn't stop. They were never meant to be our boss. They were never meant to be in control of our land, our water, our children, our air, and everything else they want. The, these things were never meant to be. And, and it doesn't make me happy to say that we're at this predicament and we have to take some serious action. I wish I didn't have to remind the sheriffs of their duty, but you know what? If we don't do this, what happens? We watch America die. She's dying right now. She's on her deathbed. Let's not make any bones about this. She's on her deathbed. She's on life support. And we can revive her. She needs CPR really bad. And you know what kind of CPR I'm talking about? It's called constitutional principled resuscitation. We can do it. Okay? Now, All right, we're, we're getting to the close here, and I, I want to just reiterate one other thing. Uh, just because everybody else in government, doesn't matter if it's everybody at the state legislature in, in Austin, doesn't matter if it's everybody just to, pretty much the way it is today in Washington, D.C., if all these bureaucracies and bureaucrats and officials and um, leaders all trample the Constitution, does that bestow any duty or responsibility on your local officials to go along? It's quite the opposite. We have a sacred duty and a responsibility to stand against anyone violating the Constitution in your jurisdiction. Your sheriff is the ultimate say on that issue. Do we really have time or money to take every one of those issues to court? Do you know what? In retrospect, I shouldn't have filed this lawsuit. I told you how bad it could have been for us if we had lost. I would have hurt the country instead of help. I should have just done my duty. I didn't have to ask anybody permission to keep my oath. I'm going to take the federal government to court? No! Don't take it to court. We there's, this cost three and a half years and $350,000. We're going to do that on every one of those? Come on. No. Sheriff Prince and I should have just said, this isn't going to happen. The other sheriffs in the other, in, in the other counties should have just stood together and said, the Brady Bill is not happening here. We're not going to do it. We should have just sent it back to Washington, D.C. and said, well, hey, thanks for your Brady Bill, but, you know, <laughs> it's not going to happen here. No. So, the, the point is, this is the first time in history that a law actually commandeered the sheriff for federal bidding under the threat of being arrested. There was no money attached to this. It was an unfunded mandate. Would I have done it if they paid me? <laughs> no. That would have just added an interesting twist to the whole thing. But no, whether they paid me or not, I wasn't going to, what, participate in a federal gun control scheme that I knew was unconstitutional. I couldn't do that. And yes, Judge Roll in our district court case in Tucson said, thus, Sheriff Mack is forced to decide between keeping his oath or obeying the act. Ha. Huh. And what happens today when your sheriff has that same quandary placed before him in what he's supposed to do? It should be automatic. I'll keep my oath to my people who hired me, who paid me. and. As I discovered everything in this ruling, uh, just the most amazing ruling. Some of you have this. Some of you have read it. It's absolutely astonishing. And the, the part that made it all worthwhile to me, the roller coaster and the ups and the downs and losing everything that we ended up losing, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it was all worthwhile when I read one sentence. Quote, 
And it's on page 36 of the book, by the way. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Don't you wish everyone serving the state of Texas and your individual counties knew and understood that principle? Man, oh man. We would need Deborah Medina to run for governor if they knew and understood that. But you have somebody running who does know and understand that principle. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. End quote. A crisis usually caused by our own government. And they come with this silver platter answer, more government will take care of you. Yeah. I can't wait to see what they do next. <laughs> but today we're part of this revolution. And uh, I've read the Constitution over and over, the Declaration of Independence. And where do we find in all of that what government is for? No, it's not the preamble. Right after that part that we hear every 4th of July and every time there's a politician that wants to try to convince you that they know and understand what's really going on and that they're patriotic, you know, right after they, that part of we hold these truths to be self-evident, uh, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it's the next line. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's why you have a sheriff. That's why you have a governor, a state legislator. Well, that's why you have a, uh, a president. Uh, yeah. Look how far-fetched that is. And uh, it, it just has gone too far, folks. We've got to get busy. We can no longer stand on the sidelines and cheer the parade as it goes by. We've got to get involved. Every one of you here tonight has the power to make that happen. You know that when I filed the lawsuit, I thought I was going to be the only one. There was no cooperation. There were no phone calls from other sheriffs. I didn't even know. I never talked to Sheriff Prince. I found out that he joined the lawsuit on CBS Morning News on my drive to work. That's how I found out. And then, then after that, a couple of sheriffs did call me and say that they wanted to join. And I met with one of them who is still sheriff in, uh, I think it's Jefferson County. Anyway, it's Mississippi, Sheriff Billy McGee. He's still sheriff. And uh, he was the, uh, another one that joined the lawsuit. It was a great reunion to see him again just a few weeks ago in uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And, but the power of one. We're talking about two small-town sheriffs that changed the history of our country. Do you know that this actually stopped Brady Bills 2, 3, 4, and 5? Yeah, you didn't know about that either, did you? Yeah, Brady Bill 2 was actually uh, introduced by Senator Moynihan uh, just a few weeks after we filed this lawsuit because he was that's what he was supposed to do. Uh, but it never even got out of committee because of our lawsuit. And things can happen. Make sure that you do one thing that you have hope because there still is hope. This is still America. This is our country. It's in our hands. It's up to us. And when the Revolutionary War was going on, some of the people weren't too sure they wanted to get involved. Do you know any of those today? <laughs> you have them in your family and I have them in mine. And uh, some of them were starting to get off the fence a little bit, and they started asking John Adams, you know, they said, why would we fight the greatest empire in the world? How could we possibly beat these people? They have a navy, the biggest navy in the world. They have an army. We have a militia. And he said this, and it applies to every one of us today. Duty is ours. Results are God's. So my dear friends, my fellow Americans, let's do our duty and leave the rest to him. Thank you so much.
I think Sheriff Mack should just move to Houston and then run for sheriff. Um, we are going to take a very brief intermission.